Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Aquarium Line Online Academy Summer Kids Club. My name is Emily. We are broadcasting live from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, and I'm here with my friend, Miss Sarah, and we are here to talk with you today about one of my favorite topics in the ocean. Now, if you have questions or comments, feel free to text us. Uh, we're going to put up a number right here, and we would love to hear from you. So text us at 562-286-1838. If you're watching this after we've gone live, feel free to email us. We will uh, answer your questions as we get them. The email address is live, L-I-V-E, at L-B-A-O-P dot org. All right, wonderful. So one of my favorite things, of course, you're going to say, oh, it's the ocean. Th okay, that's true. One of my favorite things is the ocean, but there is an entire world that you may not have seen in the ocean. Now, I get it. This may even be an entire world you haven't quite seen in the ocean. Take a look right here. Now, this right here is a live look at one of our exhibits. This is the Tropical Pacific Gallery. Now, here in Big Trop, we call it, this is a coral reef habitat, a living landscape. So all the things you see behind me on the rocks, the corals there, are part of this beautiful in, uh, habitat, this neighborhood, where these animals happen to live. Now, if we were to also touch the water, the water is actually really warm to the touch, like a bathtub. It's like 80, 80 degrees in there. Um, so it's really, really warm. And you can see there's all different kinds of animals. But what you don't see is sort of this hidden world in the ocean. Now, if we were to go to Palau, which is what this exhibit is actually modeled after, Palau might look something like this, right? We might see bigger fish and things like that, but there's an entire universe in the ocean that is sort of unseen, and it is all made up of ocean drifters. And so that's what we're actually gonna be talking about today. And when I talk about ocean drifters, uh, I talk, I'm talking about creatures in the ocean, like living things in the ocean that just go with the flow. Now, some of them are really small. Some of them are, are much bigger. Some of them will stay as ocean drifters their whole lives, and some of them will drift for a little bit of their life, and then they get bigger and bigger and bigger, and then they swim on their own. So it can be a big part of different creatures' lives out there. And so we're going to take a look at some of those today. Now, I'm going to actually start by talking about the ocean drifters or plankton that are out there that are really different from me and you. They're, in fact, not even animals. So we're going to start with ocean drifters that act like plants. Before we do that, though, let's think about plants for a moment. When you think about plants, what are, what's really remarkable about plants? What are some things you know about plants? Hmm. Well, one thing I notice is that they don't move a ton, right? They move a little bit. Maybe if the breeze is blowing, maybe their seeds move and things like that. But plants in general don't, don't really move a whole lot. Um, the other thing about plants is really that's kind of unique is the way they get their food, right? Are you familiar with that? What is that called, the way that a plant makes its food? Yeah, if you said photosynthesis, that's correct. Plants on land take sunlight, carbon dioxide, water, and other nutrients, and they make their own food. And so they're the base of our food chain. Now, in the ocean, there is a microscopic world of these creatures, of these phytoplankton or plant-like plankton. So in just a moment, we're going to show you a zoomed-in picture, um, or maybe a zoomed-out picture, whichever one <laughs> that Sarah can find really quick, um, of what these plant-like plankton look like. And so they're not actually plants, but they act a lot like plants. They don't really even look much like plants. So take a look right here. This is a zoomed in picture of a sample of water where we've collected a bunch of these microscopic plant-like phytoplankton. Uh, what do you notice here? Does anything surprise you? I, you know what really surprises me is that they're, they're kind of beautiful, right? And they have, some of these have really specific shapes. Um, and there's a couple that are the same. And there's many that actually look pretty different. 
There's a bunch of them that are these round ones. They look like kind of transparent too, right? There's ones that are shaped like rings. There's some that are shaped kind of like, I'm not even sure what I would describe that as. It almost looks like, um, like a pokey rock or something. Um, and then there are some that have dark parts in them. There are even some that look like little, it, these to me look almost like someone took a bunch of like miniature uh, cakes, right? And sort of like distributed them like that. Oh, I even see one up here that surprises me because it almost looks like a little chain, like a little rope up there. So this is even just a small look at some of the diversity of phytoplankton or plant-like plankton. Now, these are microscopic creatures, so you have to zoom way in. And in fact, the kind of net we would use to collect these types of creatures has really, really small openings in it. Let me show you what it would look like. So this right here is a plankton net. Now, this is just the net portion. We actually don't have the end of it, but you can see it almost looks like like a just fabric right here. It's got a mouth on this side, an opening. We have a little bridle or something that attaches to like a, a rope or a line, right? And um, so we, we drag this through the water. And as it goes through the water, um, there's a little tube we can attach to the end and it captures all these teeny tiny creatures, whatever is big enough to stay inside of this. So if we want really, really tiny, tiny, tiny phytoplankton, we take mesh that's really, really tiny too, so it can stay inside. And um, sometimes the really finest ones feel kind of, the net feels silky, it's so soft because the, the little holes are really, really tiny. And that's how we're able to capture these plant-like plankton. So there's all these different shapes here, and some of them uh, on the outside are made of different materials. And so all of these creatures that you see here are living things. They're microscopic. They take sunlight, nutrients, and water in, and that's, they make their own food and they grow. And this right here, just like plants are the base of the food chain in our land-based food web, uh, this is the base, often the base of the food chain in the ocean. Now, the really interesting thing is um, when you have lots of this, which we, can, we can't even see. Like if you were to scoop it up in the water, you wouldn't even be able to see any of it. You have to look under a microscope. But the amazing thing is sometimes we get so many of the plankton, these different types of phytoplankton that are out there, that we can actually see it, which I think is really interesting. So I think we have um, two pictures of what these blooms of plant plankton end up looking like. And remember, as I mentioned, this is the base of the food chain in the ocean. So we don't even see it most of the time, but it's out there and it supports an incredible diversity of animals because there's a bunch of things that eat the plants and then so on and then other animals that eat those animals and so on and so forth. So this is a really beautiful image from space. So this is a satellite image um, of our of our planet. It's a little bit hard to tell here, but for those of you who have are sort of interested in geography, um, this is actually off of the coast of Alaska. So you can see that there's like a tail, there's like a, like a big circle up here, and then there's like a tail down here. Um, that is off the coast of Alaska. What do you notice about the water right off our coast, or right off this coast? It, it looks kind of green, right? Like it looks vividly green. Now, I'm not actually sure if um, they sort of dialed up the, the filters, the colors a little bit, but when you have enough of these plankton from space, it actually does look like bright bluish greenish from space. And so this is an example of um, there being so many of these plant plankton in the ocean, we can even see it. So even if you scooped it up there, you wouldn't be able to see it, but from space, there's so, so many of them that we're actually able to see it. And this supports a lot of life. Um, I might have tr Sarah try to find the other, um, if we can find the other picture of a, um, a more local phytoplankton bloom, because there's all different kinds of phytoplankton, and they're really, really different from each other. We just saw a small little bit of um, the, the types, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of types. They all look different. They have different body shapes, body sizes. They even sometimes make their food in slightly different ways, um, and so... There's a lot of diversity in this underwater, invisible world. 
Um, and when we're able to, we'll, we'll try and show you a, another picture maybe of um, the, do we have a red tide, that one red tide picture? All right. So um, we'll try and get that to you. Oh, right here. Once again, I'm, I'm not actually sure if this picture has a little bit of uh, like a filter on it to make it look a little bit brighter. Usually when I see red tides going on, they look kind of rusty, sort of a brownish red color. Um, but this is actually not a satellite image, but this is probably a drone or an airplane that's flying over. Um, and you can see this is ocean water right here. And um, oh, actually, can we see? Oh, I'm not sure if that's actually, be, that might be sediment there, but all of this that you can see right here that's reddish is actually microscopic plant-like creatures that there are just so many of them that they're, they can be seen just with the, the naked eye. So it's really, really interesting. And where there's a lot of this, there's a lot of the rest of the food web too. Sometimes it can be a problem when there's more of this than the food web can handle. So um, we can talk about that a little bit later. But it's a really incredible thing. I mean, this is an underwater, completely unseen world. And all of these creatures, all of these plant-like creatures just drift. So sometimes it's even hard to predict where they'll be and when they'll be there. Um, you really have to be able to study where the ocean currents are and where the nutrients are coming in that might seed a phytoplankton bloom like this. Now it does look like we are getting some questions. Um, oh, I love this question. <laughs> I'm, I'm really glad. There's somebody that texted in and said, wow, so cool. Do you have a favorite phytoplankton? Um, there are so many. I think uh, I actually, I don't think we actually have a picture of this, but when I was in school, so I went to school and studied plankton, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to teach this class, because I just love plankton. Um, we actually studied a type of plankton. Um, so uh, there, there's two types that I actually think are really cool. Um, one type is sort of like the one that we looked at earlier that looks like um, clear and has almost looks like crystally looking. Um, in, a, in a lot of ways, I think about it like, has anybody ever played with a kaleidoscope? Yeah, if you look through a kaleidoscope, and you see like these different like crystally looking images. Um, those are diatoms, uh, so not in the kaleidoscope, but that reminds me of diatoms, which are a type of phytoplankton that um, have uh, sort of glass outsides, which I think is really, really cool. So they're really, really beautiful, and they're usually pretty big. Um, when it comes to the other one that I like, um, there, there's a couple of odd ones that, that I really like. I studied um, one type of phytoplankton um, that made like mucousy outsides and um, they would form these like blobs basically. Um, this is another type of plankton that's really cool. So take a look here and this actually is a nice segue because we're going to move on from plant-like plankton to animal plankton. But as we drift through here you can see all sorts of different creatures. Some of these things that look um, a little bit more regular like this and like this, um, those are plant plankton. So um, uh, many of those are things like coccolithophores, and they have all these really interesting names. And they are all different parts of different food webs all over in the ocean, which I think is, is really cool. Um, yeah, and, and in different places, it, it makes a big difference. So um, when I was in school, I studied those blobby uh, phytoplankton. Um, those are called theocystis. They just ma make these sort of like clumpy um, phytoplankton balls. Um, and that is like a part of the food chain in Antarctica, which is kind of cool. Um, so let's take a look. This is almost, actually, Sarah, if you want to play this again, I love this little movie clip. This is, uh, I think, created by NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And this little image is almost like if you were teeny tiny and microscopic and swimming through um, a big old drop of water, or maybe a, a volume of water. And you can see there are some other creatures coming by us. So we're going to see what this world has to share with us um, when it comes to the animal-like plankton. Now, we have talked so far about plant-like plankton. Those are called phytoplankton. But now we're going to move to the animal-like plankton, which are zooplankton. And there's a lot of different animals that fall into that group. As I mentioned before, the only thing that all of those have in common is that they're drifters. They drift in the ocean. They go with the flow. They don't swim against a current. Uh, now, but as I mentioned, some of them 
start as plankton and stay their whole life as plankton. And some of them start as plankton and then they grow bigger and bigger and then become big enough to like swim on their own or move on their own or they stop being plankton. So we're going to look at a few maybe first that start as plankton and then always live as, um, as plankton. Um, and some of them we can see here in these um, little pictures. Um, we can see there's an interesting looking one right there. And I might actually go over and draw like a little cartoon of it. Oh, there's another one right there that I'm looking at. This is a side view. Now I'm going to draw something over here um, on my sideboard for you. And I would love to know if you recognize anything that looks like this. So I'm going to come over and I'm going to draw for you. Because this is actually a plankton that, uh, or this is a version of a plankton that that people have actually seen before. Whoops. All right, so I have, um, I have a whiteboard here. I'm drawing them aside for you. One of the plankton that I just saw in that little movie there is one of the most um, abundant or uh, commonly found plankton that you'll find in the ocean. And this is sort of a simplification of it, but it's kind of a rice grain shape. It's got a long oval body. It's got kind of like a little, ta uh, little tail at the end. Sorry, let me fix the tail here. So it has a little tail. Sometimes it has like little paddles and little spines on it. And it's got two long antenna like this. And it's got one eye. And it actually has a bunch of like little legs and stuff that are underneath um, that I won't draw. But, but you can see it's got a rice grain shape, two long antenna, one big eye, and maybe may remind you of a cartoon that you might have heard of. Um, this, my drawing will not look anything, or not quite like the cartoon, but it looks something like this. He's got a long rice grain shape um, body. He's got one eye. He's usually angry. Um, so there's a cartoon character out there that doesn't quite look like this, um, but he's got two antenna. He's got one eye. Um, he's got some arms and legs. You've probably heard of it because uh, that's just like Plankton, right, from SpongeBob. Luckily, mine doesn't quite look like him, so we won't uh, run into any copyright issues. But you can see that he's rice grain shaped, got one eye, got these hairy antenna. And that is actually a real life Plankton that looks more like this. It's a real thing. So there's some good science here. Um, I will say that the real life one is not as angry and uh, is, not <laughs> is not a funny char cartoon character. But... Um, it is actually based off of a real thing. And this is called a copepod. So the plankton that you might have heard from SpongeBob is actually a real life creature called a copepod. And I, I think, Sarah, do we have a picture of a copepod? Oh, wonderful. See, so this picture is actually much better than my picture. But you can see it's got this long rice grain shaped body. It's got the tail at the end. It's got some little legs. It's got these antenna with kind of little hairs and stuff on them. So this creature is a type of a plankton. It drifts, and copepods are one of the most abundant creatures in our ocean. Um, and in fact, there's um, almost probably, I mean, it's one of the most abundant types of plankton out there. So um, it's, it's really, really cool. And uh, the thing about it that's neat is it's a type of crustacean. Has anybody ever heard the word crustacean? Now, when I think of crustacean, I think of crabs, lobsters, things like that. This is kind of the cousin to crabs and lobsters, but it's teeny, teeny, tiny, and it drifts in the ocean. Now, the cool thing about plankton, this kind of plankton, is that um, they drift, but even though they drift, they can actually do tiny little tumbles. So they actually do teeny little cartwheels, and um, they can smell with their antenna. And so that's actually one of the reasons why they have these giant antenna is it helps them detect chemicals in the ocean. Um, and sometimes when they reach something that they like to eat, they just tumble a little bit more, hoping to run into their food. Because that's the really interesting thing about life as an ocean drifter is that you can't swim really well, so it's hard to swim over to your food. You have to sort of twist and tumble and turn almost in place and hope that you run into your food. So it's a really different world out there. So copepods are one of my favorite zooplankton or animal-like plankton. As I mentioned, this one is a crustacean.
We've also got a couple of other pictures of some zooplankton, I think. And Sarah, if you can find any more, you can just pop up whatever we've got. Um, but I really, really love um, zooplankton. It's another one of those creatures that I used to study. Now, um, there are some zooplankton, the copepods that we were just looking at, are pretty small. Like sometimes you can see them. If there's enough of them, you'll see them sort of moving around in a sample, in a plankton sample. But most of the time, you can't see those copepods. Um, and, uh, but but they're, they're out there. I actually guarantee that if you've been in the ocean at any point, you probably had copepods and other little zooplankton, maybe even like in your ears, maybe even up your nose. They're out there. They're everywhere out in the ocean. Now, this is another type of crustacean um, zooplankton. And this one, uh, I know you might be like, oh, it looks kind of the same. Well, this one's a little bit different. You can see it has two eyes, right? So it actually has two big eyes. It's got this long body, and it's got really distinct legs, right? This is actually one um, that's important here at the aquarium. So this is actually called Artemia or brine shrimp. And so this is a slightly bigger, this is slightly bigger than a copepod because you can actually see these. They're about the size, if anybody's familiar um, with them, they're about the size as grown-ups as a staple. So if you've ever used a stapler, they're about as big as a staple um, when they're full grown. And we actually use these as food here at the aquarium. We use both adults, and then there's a little baby one back here. We use the babies as well, baby brine shrimp. And uh, because plankton, so there's phytoplankton, which are the base of the food chain, but zooplankton are the next layer, and they're really important in the food chain too, because it turns out a lot of plankton eat other plankton, and a lot of fish eat plankton. Um, and we know that here at the aquarium, because we feed out a lot of these brine shrimp. So these are some examples of zooplankton, animal ocean drifters, who are born as plankton and spend their whole life as plankton. Um, sometimes they're just real little when they're born, and even when they get bigger, they're still pretty small. They, they end up drifting uh, for, for their entire uh, life. But there are some plankton, though, that start off as plankton, and then they grow bigger and bigger, and they grow out of the plankton. So I'm going to go and I'm going to show you a cartoon that I drew of another plankton. Now, it's a baby. It's a very cute baby. But when it grows up, you may not believe what it actually turns into. Now, um, let me move my copepod picture for you. And I want to introduce you to just the most adorable little baby right here. Look how cute this baby is. I'm going to zoom in, too. Now, um, in real life, whoa, I zoomed way in there. Now, in real life, if we were to look at this creature under the microscope, we could probably, like, barely see it under a microscope. But they're out there. Now, you may notice, like, when you look at this, you say, Emily, you just drew a big blob, right? Any guesses what this might turn into? Now, I'll give you a clue. It doesn't look anything like it's grown up. It really doesn't. But maybe I'll give you some clues about the grown up, and it can help you decide what it might be. So this is the amazing thing about some animal plankton is some animals, they have to start their life like this. Um, they start really, really small, and this actually helps them because as babies, they can travel farther away from where they were born. And so this is actually a really important stage for a lot of animals. But then, of course, the idea is to get bigger and bigger and bigger so that um, they can be big grown-ups, right? So let me give you a couple of clues about this baby. Now, this baby is a plankton, but when it grows up, it's going to be something that's got spiny skin and that we have here in our touch pools at the aquarium. Oh, maybe some of you are like, but I've, I've, never, I've never been there. Okay, maybe I'll give you another clue. So this baby, when it grows up, will have spiny skin. It's in touch pools here at the aquarium. And sometimes it has five or more arms. Any guesses? Ooh, I love that somebody made an observation, though. They said, it looks like a mud sculpture. I like what you're thinking. And in fact, I can even add to that. Sometimes the grown-ups live on mud. 
maybe that's my inspiration, my art inspiration here. Any guesses what this might, this cute little baby might be when it grows up? Not sure. Oh, someone guessed it. A sea star. You are correct. So this little blob mud sculpture, a baby, um, is actually transparent when they're babies, uh, but they grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And the plankton phase, remember, allows them to sort of disperse or travel farther away from where they were born. And then they grow up into this. They become sea stars. And it's pretty amazing to think about the transformation, right? Actually, they spend um, the, the blob phase of their life is relatively short. Then they start growing and growing. Um, they're eating um, while they can. And, uh, they, and they eat what they can, plankton and other things, while they can. And as they get bigger, they, they actually start to look a little bit more sea starish. So you'll see the distinct arms start forming. They'll even look like an itty bitty little sea star. And they'll even drift as an itty bitty looking, almost snowflake like creature. But the whole name of the game is to get big enough to land on a rock and start growing real big. And um, also at that point, they're more developed and they can eat the things that sea stars eat. Um, different sea stars have different diets, but they usually eat things that are on the bottom. Um, and so they'll eat um, pretty much anything that they can capture and, uh, and digest. And so the, uh, that is the goal, the end point for those little itty bitty plankton that are out there. Now, there are even some fish that start as plankton and similar life history um, in the way that that plankton phase allows those little, little baby fish to disperse and then they, they eat and eat and eat and try to get to be much, much bigger. Um, looks like we are getting another question. Oh, do sea urchin babies look similar? Good question because the cousin of a sea star is a sea urchin. Um, now, of course, the grown-ups don't look that similar, but they do have a couple things in common, right? They have two feet um, and they have this like spiny skin. So the sea urchin babies look a little bit similar. I think they look a little pokier, so a little less like muddy looking and a little bit pokier, um, but they're still clear and they're still a little bit blobby. They just have um, slightly more pronounced um, kind of Instead of the blobs, they're a little bit more pronounced in terms of like the projections that you see coming out of it. I actually encourage you to look it up. That it's a pretty cool looking creature um, when they when they're born. Uh, the other amazing plankton for those of you that really want to look it up, um, we don't happen to have a picture, I think, but it just reminded me. Um, baby lobsters are pretty wild looking too, um, and so if you look up a larval lobster or a phylosoma. Um, they don't look anything like grown-ups. So it's another really interesting thing. Like there's an entire part of these creatures' lives that we don't even see because they're so tiny and they're out there drifting. So um, let me see if there's any other of the creatures. And in fact, sea cucumbers, the other cousin of, um, distant cousin of sea stars and sea urchins also have a blobby looking um, larval stage as well. Sarah, do we have another question? Oh, okay. Oh yeah, there is a sea cucumber right above my head, right over here. So you guys can see it right over here. Um, sea stars, sea urchins, sea cucumbers are all sort of like distant cousins. Um, and they all have their life where they start off as plankton and then get bigger and bigger and bigger and then turn into the, the sort of um, bottom dwelling uh, adults that you see here. All right. Um, even, even these little guys, even anemones start their life and jellies start their life as plankton. So maybe we'll um, wrap up and just show you a picture of um, baby jellies. And uh, that, that, of course, is an example of a creature, though, that starts as plankton and then finishes its life as plankton. But these are moon jellies. And if you look carefully, it almost looks like these moon jellies are floating in, like, snow or a snow globe, right? But all those little creatures that look like little flowers back there are ephyra. They are baby jellies waiting to get bigger and bigger and bigger by growing and eating and eating. And so that is what they look like. And here at the Aquarium of the Pacific, we actually grow these jellies up um, from itty bitty tiny, tiny creatures. Um, then they reach one phase where they're stuck to the ground or stuck to a, a hard surface. And then they create this stage, the little ephyra stage. And then they grow up and become these big jellies. And then they drift 
for the rest of their lives. Um, we grow these here, and I think about it almost like a garden. Um, so we have an entire sort of lab section where we grow plankton, and we watch them as they go. And, and this is like thousands and thousands of them, and they grow into these other ocean drifters that are really, really beautiful. All right. Well, we are going to wrap up for the day. Um, if you have any last minute questions, I could probably take one question now. But this is a really beautiful view of our sea nettle camera. And you can see this, uh, watch this live on our uh, website. I also think it's very calming. Jellies are a great example of something that spend their entire life as a plankton. Um, they do start as really tiny plankton as babies. Um, but then, of course, they get bigger and bigger. Um, and through actually a much more complex life cycle, then they become these drifters that you see here. They can move a little bit, but they don't move against a current, which is true of all of the ocean drifters. All right, I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope that you have a wonderful day. We are going to start up again tomorrow for Aquarium Online Academy Summer Kids Club tomorrow at 9 a.m., and we have programs every hour on the hour. We hope to see you then. Bye, everybody.